so moving over to video number two now to carry on talking about Simon Baron Cohen's um, book on zero degrees of empathy and his and what he has to say here. So Simon Baron Cohen says that zero empathy, as he defines it, is basically to treat others instrumentally or or as objects. Um, so in other words, if you have zero degrees of empathy, you treat others instrumentally in a sense that um, you're, you, 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 you're basically um, wanting to get your own needs met, in a sense, and you're not, go you're not so going to be seeing the other people as, like, um, separate to you in a way, like you're not relating to them with their own needs, wants and desires, as it were, but it's more about, like, how they can serve your own needs and desires. Um, so that's how he defines zero degrees of empathy. But he then talk, but then of course um, he splits the zero degrees of empathy into two types of empathy disorder: zero degrees negative and zero degrees positive. And he says that autism is a zero degrees positive type of empathy deficit because autistic people, although they struggle with empathy and sometimes to the point of having zero degrees, um, basically they have redeeming features. And he argues that the redeeming features in autism is the high degree of systematising. Um, and I do agree with him there. I just disagree that it's a male thing. I, I, that's where I disagree. I think autism it does contain high degrees of systematising. I just don't think it's always in a way... I just don't think it's as, like... I just disagree that this is gendered, basically. Or, like, has to be gendered. Um, and, of course, systematising doesn't just involve those stereotypical areas that people always kind of... Um, talk about like maths and science, this whole idea that autism is all about STEM, when in actual fact that, that is a stereotype because many autistic people actually struggle with maths, like I do, I've got a calculus so I struggle with maths and a lot of autistic people might find some of the abstract parts of science, particularly in physics and things like that, quite difficult to get their heads around. But there are many different types of systematising, knitting, which I'm good at, is a form of systematising, you have to follow patterns um, and it's yeah, you have to follow patterns and you have to work how the knitting system works. I'm actually very good at that. So, yeah, I've got quite high degrees of systematising. Not in maths, but I'm good at knitting. And cooking, actually, is a type of systematising. So, you know, this idea that men are better systematised than women is not true. And I disagree with something back right now. I think it's just that um, the types of systematising that men and women do is can be different because of the way society has conditioned men and women to behave differently. So women have historically done a lot of work in the kitchen. Um... And that was what the feminist movement was trying to, you know, get women out of the kitchen sort of thing. Some women actually like being in the kitchen, though. I like being in the kitchen, so it's not a good case. All women want to be freed from the kitchen. I guess it depends on whether you're, whether you're in the kitchen because you want to be or whether you're in the kitchen trying, um, serving someone else and you don't want to do that. But if it's part of your own choice to being in the kitchen, and, you know, and you want to do that, that's, that's your choice, isn't it? But, um, yeah, cook, those things that historically been gendered as female can contain actually a high degree of systematising. Um, so yeah, cooking is a form of systematising, sewing, knitting, um, historically gendered as female, but they're all systematising activities actually. Um, anything which doesn't involve uh, the need to relate to other people, um, anything that doesn't involve the need to empathise, but instead to understand how systems work, whatever those systems may be, um, knitting, sewing, all systematising, embroidery, systematising, um, not, just the, not just the gendered male activities, because we often focus on those activities that are gendered male and think that they're systematising. But, but also there are many activities gendered female that are also systematising. Um. <clears throat> so yeah, I'd say I am very high on systematising. Um, I do everything systematically. Um, so I guess I'm quite stereotypically autistic in that respect. <laughs> um, just not in a maths way. Um. But what, so what Simon Van Cohen says is that, um, yeah, that autism has a redeeming feature, um, which is the ability to systematise. Um, I disagree, as you all know, because I'm critical of the neurodiversity movement, and unfortunately Simon Van Cohen has thrown his lot in with some of the NDM rhetoric. Um, I do agree that this can be a redeeming feature of autism. I've never been someone who said that autism is an unyielding negative. If you've seen some of my other videos, I'm far more nuanced than that. I just say that it, it's, it, is a, it is a very serious disability. Um, and, and yes, it does have some redeeming features, but they don't obviously... Um, what's the word? They don't, in a sense... Um, 
change the fact that autism is essentially a disability and um, they don't turn it into a positive but I do agree with um, Cohen that yeah they can be redeeming to some extent like I often talk about my special interest as like, a, as like autism's healing mechanism for example and autism special interests tend to be very high in systematising as well um, so he says there's a zero empathy positive because of that redeeming aspect the low empathy is counterbalanced by the high systematising and um, also he says that autistics tend not, this is really important, tend not to be implicated in cruelty to others. So it's actually, autistics as a group are not usually implicated in cruelty to others. It doesn't mean that autistics can't be cruel, because there have obviously been cases of autistics who've been cruel. Not just like any other group, autistics vary, people are people. Um, but, it does, but autistics as a group are no more likely to be cruel than a non-autistic. This, this zero degrees of empathy does not have any bearing on um, morals, basically, when it comes to autism. And that's because it's zero empathy positive. Um, so it's usually, autistics can sometimes cause, can be unintentionally, um, can do unintentionally not so nice things. But, there's, but in autism, there's usually no cruel intent. The person doesn't want to harm others, the person does care about others. Um, And, and, a, and the reason there's no cruel intent, by the way, in autism is that autistics can lack both parts of empathy. So not just the effective side. I'll come on to the fact that some autistics actually do have effective empathy in a moment, because that's important too. But the key defining characteristic of autism is the deficit in cognitive empathy. So it's possible to be autistic and to have effective empathy. Although Simon Van Cohen says that actually effective empathy is also often reduced in autism, and I'd actually agree with him. It certainly wasn't me when I was younger. That doesn't mean I'm a bad person. Because um, I do struggle with feelings and emotions. I'm not going to beat around the bush about that. Um, but clearly, obviously, I do care, and I've got very, very high moral compass. Hence the fact I don't want to spread COVID, for example. That shows I care and have a moral compass because I don't want to cause suffering, for example, and things like that. And I, do, and I always try to do the right thing. Um, but but because of that deficit in cognitive empathy, even if an autistic struggles with effective empathy, because they've got difficulties with cognitive empathy, it's very, very difficult for them to actually um, intentionally act with cruelty, because to do that, you need to have cognitive empathy, basically. And if you don't have cognitive empathy, you know, you're not going to have that ability so, yeah. Um, he says here that in autism, both aspects of empathy may be impaired, um, or just a cognitive component. But the cognitive component is a good defining feature in autism. So, it's possible for someone with autism to have both features that are impaired. It's also possible to be autistic and to have good, effective empathy, or to be very uh, uh, um, empathetic in the effective side, but to still have an empathy deficit because they struggle with the cognitive empathy. So he does make a point that not all autistics are zero degrees. Zero degrees is quite extreme. Um, he says particularly among the more high-functioning ones, it's possible just to have a um, below-average empathy. So he has a whole kind of uh, spectrum of empathy disorders in autism. Some are more severe than others, basically. Um, and he also says getting autism low empathy leads them to avoid other people as they're confusing. Um, so far from trying to be cruel or to harm others, as you find psychopathy and autism, it's the opposite. Autistics often don't really get that great pleasure or motivation around being around people. Yet, you know, they're not people-focused in that way, you know, um, but they do care about other people. Yet they can be attached to other people, even if it is a sort of instrumental attachment and based around routines more than an empathetic attachment. Autistics can still be very, very attached to other people and care about them. And... Um, but it's just that autistics generally aren't people, as, as a group, are less people motivated, are less socially motivated. So they're not seeking out to like harm others because it, the thought doesn't even occur to autistics. Um, where psychopaths kind of build their life around that because psychopaths have a very kind of people-focused, motivated kind of um, thought process. And also psychopaths, by the way, have very good social skills. Um, unlike autistics, um, which is why they're so dangerous as well. He says here that the strong systematising leads autistics through powerful logic 
to develop a moral code through fairness and justice. And this moral code is often very, very pronounced. A moral code in autism can often be even stronger than a neurotypical. It's an extreme need to do right. Um, very, very preoccupied with fairness, doing the right thing, not causing suffering, help, you know, that sort of thing. A sort of um, compassion towards others, in a sense. Like, not wanting to cause suffering, wanting to do the right thing. Um, like I said earlier about my extreme need not to not to infect people with disease and stuff like that obviously shows I care and have a really strong moral compass because lots of people don't care about spreading disease but when I do care because I don't want to cause suffering so that shows that just because you have um, empathy problem and I do struggle I would say both components of empathy but particularly cognitive but nevertheless as you can see I'm a highly moral person um, so that just shows that just because you struggle with empathy doesn't mean you don't care and it doesn't mean that you and also I care a lot about like animals and things like that. Like for example, I can't harm a spider. A lot of people don't give a crap about flushing a spider down the toilet. But I would feel, I, I, that makes me feel really guilty. So I try not to do that. Again, which shows I care. Um, even if I struggle with empathy. So that's what I mean. And it says here that psychopaths, unlike autistics, lack a moral compass that most people develop using empathy and they also lack a moral compass that people with autism develop using systematising so he argues basically that autistics have a moral compass which can be just as strong as non-autistic, sometimes even stronger but they develop that moral compass through systematising as opposed to through empathy, so it's a different way to get there, using you know, you're, essentially you're using a very strong intellect to work out what's right, um, and you think a lot about it um, whereas like non-autistics tend to uh, achieve it more for a sort of empathy, essentially. Autistics achieve a moral compass through logic. You could say it doesn't really matter as long as you have a moral compass, does it really matter if it's formed through empathy or other means. I wouldn't want to be flushed down in the toilet, so I don't want to flush a spider down the toilet, you know. I'm not necessarily empathising with a spider, but I do know that it's not nice to be flushed down the toilet, you know what I mean, so... Yeah, it says here, like in autism, it's often, the code is often treat others as you would have others treat you. That doesn't require empathy, by the way, because that's very kind of self-directed. Um, empathy involves getting yourself in someone else's shoes. I've got no idea what it's like to be a spider. I'm not empathising with a spider. I'm not even trying to empathise with a spider. I just know that I don't want to be flushed down the toilet. And neither, so, therefore, logic, neither does a spider, basically. Um... as basically logical. Now, he argues here, because this is common in the NDM actually, why do some people with autism in online communities challenge this view? And he says that one possibility is that it is in the nature of empathy, that people who are low in empathy are often the last people to be aware of it. And that's basically what I was thinking. I would say that although I struggle with empathy, I'm actually, for an autistic person, quite self-aware. I do have, obviously I do have difficulties with self-awareness, but I would say that I am quite self-aware in the sense that I know I struggle with empathy. But the reason I know I struggle with empathy is through a lot of reading and self-analysis um, and know, and trying to read what empathy is and realising actually I struggle with it because I don't have what it says empathy is and thinking, well yeah, obviously I struggle with it because I know, cause, and also of course a lot of what people have told me, like my parents growing up, and things like that. So I've come to the realisation that I struggle with empathy. And it's not much I could do about it, but I'm aware of the fact. Um, although it is possible I actually have more empathy than I think I do. So that's possible as well. And I do think my empathy has developed as I've got older. Um, so I wouldn't say I have zero degrees anymore. I do think I have zero degrees as a kid. But remember, zero degrees doesn't mean you don't care. I've always been a caring person. And I talk about how I've cared in another video, show you evidence of my caring behaviour from a young age, which shows that zero degrees doesn't mean you don't care. Because um, I have been very caring, like both towards my brother and my dad and other people, and, and you know, stuff like that. So that shows like, I've, I've always been caring. Um, and I, like I said, I'll talk about that in another video. But... As, as Simon Van Cohen says here, he says... One possibility is that is in the nature of empathy that people who are low in empathy are often the last people to be aware of it. This is because empathy goes hand in hand with, with self-awareness or imagining how others see you and it's in this very area that autistic struggle. A better, so a better source of information for whether someone with autism has empathy disability 
might therefore be a third party such as a parent. Like as I said before, my parents often said about me struggling with empathy growing up and that was when um, when I discovered autism and got my autism diagnosis and it made a lot of sense and obviously I've got a really low EQ which was developed by Simon Van Cohen. <laughs> Incidentally, I only got about eight. Um, it might be a bit higher now because I think my MP has developed a bit. But, um, yeah, I would say that my awareness that I struggle with empathy a lot of it does, has come from what other people have told me, like my parents and people like that, and uh, and then figuring it all out and doing a lot of reading. So I think I have become quite self-aware. Um, it says self-report is highly unreliable in empathy. It's a bit like colour blindness, often the last person to know about it until they're given a test, as they're assuming that they're seeing the same colours as everyone else. Um... Yeah, I've had other autistics say, oh, I have a lot of empathy, like they don't agree with this whole thing. Uh, but actually, they've displayed a lack of empathy towards me and I've actually hurt my feelings a few times about even being aware of it. So I would actually dispute the fact that they don't struggle with empathy. <laughs> I think I'm just more aware of it than them. Um, that's the thing. I actually see it all the time. Autistics claiming they have empathy because they don't like this idea that they struggle with empathy. And actually, they do struggle with empathy. It's just they're not aware. They're completely blind to their own difficulty. Um, but Simon Van Cohen does say here that not all autistics have zero degrees and they might just be below average and some may have effective component um, which involves caring how others feel and not wanting to hurt them. Like with regard to the effective component by the way, um, I would say I do have that, uh, maybe not as developed as some other people. So to put it basically, I don't want to hurt other people. So that part of effective empathy.